Hi everyone. The Gemara in Nazir, in page 19, is giving us a glimpse into one of uh, one of the most uh, curious characters um, in Jewish history, in ancient Jewish history, and that is Heleni Hamalka, Queen Heleni. And let me show you. Let me uh, share the sources, and we'll we'll look uh, more into it. So the Gemara, uh, the Mishnah in Masechet Nazir, and then the Gemara mentioned that as uh, as well, is telling us the story of an incident that occurred with regard to Heleni, to Queen Heleni, whose son had gone to war, and she said, "If my son will return from the from war safely, I will be a Nazarite for seven years. I'm stopping here." We're hearing about this woman, and she's a queen, and her son is going to war. Uh, and she knows the rules of, of Nazir, and she's making a Nazirut, making a vow of Nazir, you know, saying that if he'll, he'll come safely, I will be a Nazira um, for seven years. Like, who is that woman? What is she doing? And where is she? And and we continue and we hear that and her son returned safely from the war and she was a Nazarite for seven years. And at the end of seven years, she's ascended to Eretz Israel. What's the connection between her and Eretz Israel? And apparently, if she wants to come to Eretz Israel and she's part of Masechet Nazir in the Mishnah of Eretz Israel, she is Jewish. And indeed, Heleni Amalka is a convert, her and her son, that uh, um, came from the Mamlechet Chedaib in Ashur, from in, in Assyria. Uh, we, he we hear about Queen Heleni both from Josephus and from our Jewish sources. Uh, and it, they tell about a, a queen in a foreign uh, um, um, empire or kingdom uh, at the northern side of, uh, of Assyria uh, at that time that heard from men merchandise, Jewish, Jewish uh, travelers about the Jewish religion. And she decided to become, uh, to become Jewish. She converted to Judaism, her and her son. Uh, at first, she stayed at her kingdom. And she made that vow of Nezirut, and after her son returned from, from the war safely, the war that they had as a kingdom with, other, with others, um, they decide to come and live in Eretz Israel. And apparently, we're not really sure about the specific dates, but apparently they lived in Eretz, she lived in Eretz Israel 20 years before she, before she, before she died, around the year of 50 BC, uh, a 50 um, um of the, of the second at the first uh, um, um, century, meaning about twenty years before the destruction of the of the first of the second temple at the year uh, of seventy. Um, and Josephus is also telling us that that her old kingdom, like her husband that stayed there, they send soldiers to the to the great war in Eretz Israel at, around the destruction of the second temple. Uh, helping Jews uh, against Romans. And the minute that Heleni, Queen Heleni, moves into the land of Israel, we have some sources, um, uh, some, most of them Eretz Israel, the Tosefta, the Mishnah, the Talmud Yerushalmi, but she also mentioned in the Talmud of Avli, telling, telling us about her and her encounter with Chachamim and with, and with, Jewish, uh, uh, with the Jewish religion. But also, and that's really, uh, let me just finish this source and then we'll go, go more about her. Um, so she ascended to the land of Israel and Beit Ilad instructed her in accordance with their opinion that she should be a Nazarite for an additional seven years. That's according to the opinion of Beit Ilad that a Nazir who made a, Nazir, a vow of Nazirut in Chutz Laaretz, it doesn't count because you can't be a Nazir in Chutz Laaretz because Chutzaret is not pure, there's Tum'at Eretz Amim, and then when the Nazir comes to Eretz Israel, as opposed to the opinion of Bet Shemai that you only need to keep 30 days, the minimum, Bet Hilal is saying they need to keep the same amount of Nazirut as they did in Chutz Laaretz, according to their vow. And of course, Eleni listened to them, and she uh, and she made, uh, she, she was a Nazira for another seven years. The idea of a queen, a foreign queen, becoming uh, becoming Jewish is part of what we know of Jewish history in the ancient world uh, in in the first century. Uh, that remains a big a big riddle. 
we know that there were many converts to Judaism before the destruction of the of the of the Second Temple, uh, that like about a hundred years before, maybe a little bit more. Um, and that was a phenomena around the Hellenistic world. The historians that give the, the biggest number speaks about 10% of the Hellenistic world at that time that converted to Judaism. And it still remains a question whether there were full converts becoming Jewish, keeping all the entire mitzvot. Some say that they just did it. They chose what mitzvot they want to feel, uh, they feel connected to. Um, one opinion discussed the fact that they did it because they found Judaism to be more philosophical religion that, had, that doesn't have all the mythical uh, elements like the, 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 the Greek mythology. Um, and therefore, most of the converts were an uh, um, uh, intellectual elite. We do know that most of the converts were women. So some say they were women because they didn't have to go through circumcision and accept all the mitzvot, uh, but also because women uh, from the elite, queens, uh, uh, noble ones, rich women, we know them in Chazal as matronitot, uh, had a lot of time and they were more they, they were more educated and maybe that's why they came more closer to the Jewish religion who, were very, who was very um, intellectually challenging and they loved it. And one of these one of these people were uh, was Eleni Amalka and her son and her son Munbaz. Another very beautiful story that we hear concern concerning Eleni after she already lived in the land of Israel is in the Talmud Yerushalmi of Sukkah. And the story says the following: Rabbi Uda said it happened that the Sukkah of Queen Eleni in Lydia in Lod was higher than twenty uh, cubits. And the sages were coming and going here, there, and nobody was saying a word. There's a machloket between Rabbi Yehuda and Chachamim. Chachamim are saying that sukkah that is higher than 20 amot is, is pasul. And Rabbi Yehuda is saying, no, sukkah that is higher than 20 amot is fine, it's kosher. And he brings as a proof to him the sukkah of Heleni Amalkav, Queen Heleni, saying that was that sukkah everyone knew was higher than than 20 amot and still Chachamim came came to visit Heleni during sukkot and said nothing about her sukkah and they said to him because she was a woman and a woman is not obligated she's hipturami sukkah of course they didn't say anything because the sukkah of Heleni was a sukkah of a woman and she's not obligated in sukkah so he then answered them and Rabbi Uda is telling them um, is that a proof did she not have seven learned sons? And we know of one son called Munbaz that converted together with her. With her. And here in, in the Yerushalmi, uh, uh, Rabbi Yehuda is saying, wait, wait a second. We know she has seven sons that are all, all learned. They're all Tarmidei Chachamim. Uh, could you say that the Sukhav Queen Eleni uh, only held a person's head, most of his body and his table? But it must be that the walls do not reach up all um, uh, um, all the way, and I mean, his proof, Rabbi Yudas proof, is saying, of course, that the sukkah held all her seven sons, and obviously, she had to make a kosher sukkah for them. And if she made it higher than 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 twenty amot, that means that twenty amot is fine. But not to go into the halachic uh, 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 dispute here, just by the way, the telling, the hearing about. Queen Heleni in Lod making a sukkah and, and, and her righteous and her Talmidei Chachamim sons, it's really fascinating uh, and interesting to hear. And, and also at the end of the Bavli, the chap, this, this part, this paragraph in the Bavli in sukkah, we hear that another thing that Rav Yudai, Rav Yudai is saying is, and furthermore, she performed all of her actions only in accordance with the directives of the sages. Okay, so in in the, in the in the Mishnah, can, they're talking about what they know happened about two hundred years, uh, one hundred one hundred year, and they all saying that yes, we all know that Helenia Malka, the convert, Helenia Malka did everything according to Chachamim, as we heard of the the the, the occasion of the Nazar of her Nazarites, and he's saying of course she she would never build a sukkah not according to not according to Chachamim.
Another very interesting uh, glimpse and uh, mem memory that Chachamim are bringing in the Mishnah regarding Tumun Baz and his mother is in, in the Mishnah of Yuma. And there it says King Monbaz would contribute the funds uh, required to make the handles of all the Yom Kippur vessels of gold. And Queen Helene, his mother, fashioned a de decor de decorative gold chandelier above the entrance of the sanctuary. And she also fashioned a golden tablet of, uh, on which the Torah portion relating to Sota was written. So we hear that both Heleni and her son really um, put uh, uh, invested in making the Mikdash more beautiful and more, um, more handy to the Kohanim working there. Bartenura is explaining to us that the, uh, regarding to what Heleni brought, so that there be no need to bring a Torah, a Sefer Torah, to write from it the portion of the Sota when it happened. So they will have a tablet in front of them in the Mikdash that they can look at it and write it down. Um, like we have today, the Modim de Rabbanan in Shul, that, that it's handy and, and it's there. And um, and it's definitely an, a nice memory that Chachamim have of uh, of Queen Heleni, that she looked at the Mikdash and she saw things that are missing that can make it uh, easier. Maybe because she was a woman and she paid attention to details that the men didn't pay attention to, but definitely improved the experience of uh, of the Mishkan. Um, to end that, I want to bring two um, recollections that we have uh, in the ancient world about Heleni. One is from Josephus, and Josephus who wrote um, um, uh, who wrote his uh, you know his experiences in, in, in at the war with the with the Romans and the Jews is mentioning Heleni and when he describes the um, uh, the descendant of of the walls of Jerusalem and like it's giving us a is giving us a description of where each place in Jerusalem was and the, and the length of the Choma, the wall that surrounded Jerusalem and where did it get to. And Josephus is telling us, and after that, the wall descended, the wall of Jerusalem descended towards the tomb of Queen Heleni, who was the queen of Chidaev and the daughter of Queen Izat. So Josephus, at the first century, already knows, like he tells us, he is a, is a witness of Heleni's tomb in Jerusalem that touches it at the end of the walls of Jerusalem, what we know today as at the north side of the of the of, of the old city. And that was her that's where her tomb was. And today archaeologists and historians uh, um, suggest that her tomb was part of what we know today as Kivrot Melachim, the tombs of the kings where the, the, the kings of, of the descendant of Beit David were buried. And they said it was there. It we also had a very um, like a drishat shalom, a, fair, a, a, a hello from history to us when at the at the year eight, eighteen sixty three, uh, um, a French uh, archaeologist found a sarcophagus um, with written on it the Queen from North. I'll show you the sarcophagus. We have a picture of it here. It's today in the Israel Israeli Museum. And he is he suggested that that belonged to Queen Heleni and and other others agreed agreed with him, and and another um, witness that we hear about Queen Heleni's tomb is from uh, Pausanias, who was a, a Greek ge um, geographer who who traveled around the Hellenistic world at his time. He lived at the second at the second century. Um, A.E. and uh, and he described all the places, uh, uh, the beautiful buildings in uh, in his times. And when he gets to Jerusalem, he's telling us the following: the Jews have a tomb that uh, that of Heleni, a local woman in the city of Jerusalem, which the Roman says are raised uh, uh, raised to the ground. There is a building at the tomb with a door in the middle that, like the whole. Uh, tomb is made of stone which does not open except on the day on that day at that hour and then the mechanism without assistance opened the door 
and a short time after the door closes. This happens at, the at that time, but if you try any other time to open the door, you will not be able to. Force will not open it, only break it. He describes a, a, a mechanism of the sun touching like the 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 doorknob and that opens the uh, opens the womb and and this is another you know another eyewitness at the second century telling us about the beauty and the wonder of of uh, of Queen Eleni's tomb by the way the same uh, geographer Greek geographer is saying that it is as beautiful as the mausoleum at the Helic Helicanosos, which is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, just to tell us how beautiful uh, Helene's uh, uh, tomb was. And indeed, I, you know, I, I feel I feel uh, very uh, grateful to Chachamim that mentioned Queen Helene, the, the convert, who also was a Nazarite, who knew the rules, uh, to tell us that beautiful little Jewish history story. Um, that otherwise we maybe we would never hear about her. Thank you.